Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first online lecture for 311 Programming Language Concepts. This is the first lecture of the new format. We've switched to an online uh, lecture format instead of in class. Um, and we're going to pick up where we left off with the in class. And, uh, well, we're just going to do it online. So you can watch this any time of day that you want, and you can watch it as many times as you want over and over again if you'd like. Um, so it's kind of got some advantages versus the face-to-face uh, -face class. Also, you don't really have to get up early, and you don't have to commute to the college. Um, so on that note, uh, we'll keep things positive here. Um, so this is a 311. If I go into 311, let's just take a look here at the syllabus and kind of regroup. Uh, let's see, we're also going to take a look at prologue today um, in today's lecture. Um, and so this would be the normally the lecture that would be held on 316. Last week, if you remember, um, and if you don't remember because you missed the class meeting, I sent you guys the midterms by email. So if you remember, we had the midterm. Then we came back on Monday 3-9 and we had uh, midterm review. I went over all of the correct answers on the midterm and passed them back. If you missed that class meeting, don't worry about it uh, because I sent you an email with the exam. Now, if you have a question, I've already gone over it, so I'm not going to go over it again. So if you have a question about one of your answers, then it's best to contact me by email. Um, and then we can connect uh, via the phone or actually you can contact me by phone if you wanted to. We can connect by phone, by email, by Zoom, uh, any means electronically that you'd like. I'm just not holding office hours on campus, so you'll need to connect with me um, electronically, uh, which is not a problem. I'm very available, so it should work out just fine. So that was Monday's class meeting. We went over the midterm, and we didn't have that good of a turnout, uh, which is why I sent you the midterm. So if you did not receive your midterm electronically, that means you didn't come to class and pick it up on that Monday the 9th, and instead you um, you got it, like, hopefully you got it electronically. If you did not let me know, um, it means I sent it to the wrong person or something like that, who knows. Um, we did not have class on 311 because 311 was um, canceled uh, by the university. Um, and so on 311, uh, the scheme assignment number three was due. I've already gone over scheme in the class. Um, there's a scheme lecture or two that you could review as well. Um, scheme is pretty straightforward. You can use the built-in functions. You don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. You don't have to use just the Lisp functions. At this point, just make it work. Turn it in. You still have seven days grace on it. Um, and then next week, we have assignment number four due, and assignment number four is on prologue. So today we're going to cover the prologue programming language and uh, get you up to speed on that one. Okay, um, and then after, uh, well, it's not due this week, it's due next week is the prologue assignment. And so then after that, we have spring break, and I suspect that around Monday the 6th, I don't know, I could be overly optimistic, but I suspect around the 6th, we might actually be meeting again in person. So we'll see how long this lasts online. And in the meantime, you can listen to me via the YouTube videos um, eh, instead of having to drive to the campus. So let's see how long this lasts and uh, we'll see what's, uh, we'll play it by ear. So if you do have any questions, I can't ask them. You can't ask, ask them right now. You have to sort of hold on and send me an email so I can answer your questions electronically. So in the assignments folder, if you download assignment number four, assignment number four is going to bring up the prologue assignment. And the prologue assignment here has you experiment with a language called Pro prologue. Prologue actually stands for programming logic. And so the traditional form of it is downloaded with SWI prologue. And you can install it on your computer. And you can run prologue programs and create a bunch of good stuff on your computer. Um, and load everything locally. However, there's a better interface, if you'd like, called Swish, and Swish, S-W-I, which is S-W-I Prologue, S-H stands for Shell. Uh, you can see it right here at the top of the screen. Hopefully you can see that. It says swish swish swish.swi prologueorg and when you go to this website, um, you can write all of your programs online. You can do it right here. Um, this is the uh, Welcome to Swish. You can read about it. This is an online prologue interpreter that you may use for the assignment. So you do not have to go to prologue and uh, 
for example, if I typed in uh, download uh, SWI Prolog, you don't have to download this version of it. This looks like a website from the 1970s. It still works though, and you can load Prolog locally. Um, in fact, there's, a, there's one for the Mac, there's one for Windows, and you can run SWI Prolog locally on your computer if you prefer, uh, but most students would like this better. Uh, so you go to this website, SWI Prolog, which is the same Prolog, it's the same logo, same everything. And uh, you can do the assignment right here. Um, so what are you gonna do for the assignment? Well, we'll see momentarily here. Um, but the other good thing about this is you can go into the examples folder and see the example programs that are written. And um, in the example programs, you can see already opened, okay. Oh yeah, here they are right here, I'm sorry. Uh, you can click on things like the expert system, um, I think I had the movie database clicked on before, movie database. And you can sort of see how what program looks like. And there's little explanations in here about how to write a, progr a prologue program. They're basically facts. Here's some facts, actually. These are examples of facts. And then there are some rules that are associated with it. Prologue is an expert system, developing environment. Wow, there's a lot of facts in here. Uh, wow. Um, so this is a database of movies it looks like um so you create a database and then you come over here and you ask it questions and the questions that you might ask is you know who 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 played what actor played in this movie or what actor played in that movie um so you can ask prologue questions and then prologue comes back with a yes or a no answer uh, which is basically what you're doing this is a this is the programming environment by the way and this is a programming language um so in the lecture, we're gonna see momentarily, I'm gonna go over how this works. Okay, let's go over the assignment next. So for the assignment, uh, in the assignment, it's kind of long, there's a, I mean, it's long-winded, I should say it's not really a long assignment. Um, there's a, lots of explanation in the beginning here, and there's programming and prolog, the idea of the fact, um, the idea of the rules, the queries, all this information, and then it says your assignment right here. So your assignment is to answer five questions. The first question is you're given the relations about father, mother, female, male, um, and you're gonna define the relations for the following sibling, sister, grandson, and descendant. I'm gonna show you where that is actually in the lecture today. Um, so we'll see how that works. Um, and then in number two, you're gonna write a prologue relation, which is relations are functions, and this one's called remove. Um, and it takes on three parameters, E, L, and R. That is true if R is in the list, which results from removing one instance of E from the list. So the relation is false if E isn't a member of the list. So if the element is in the list, then you remove it. If the element is not in the list, then uh, it, nothing happens, it returns false. And then uh, what are the answers to the following query? So you're gonna write this little relation, which is actually quite simple. And then you're gonna run these to see yes, no, yes, no, true, false, true, false is really what's gonna come out of it. So the answers to the queries, this is gonna be true or false, this is gonna be true or false, true or false, or true or false. So you answer those simple little questions. And then in number three, you're gonna write a relation subsequence <clears throat> that takes on list one and list two, or L1 and L2 as parameters. And that is true if list one contains a subset of the elements that are in list two in the same order. So if, if list one is inside of list two, so if list one contains, or is actually the opposite, if list two is inside of list one in the same order, then it comes back true. And then how many different proofs are there for the following queries? Well, I'm gonna talk about that too. But a proof means um, to, to ask it, to try to resolve it. And so in trying to resolve it, the proof comes back true or false. And so in this particular case, it would come back multiple times true or multiple times false for every element. For example, in this particular case, you have a list one and list two, which is A and B. Um, excuse me, this is list one, this is list two. This is list one, this is list two. And it would have to check to see if this was inside of here and it would actually come back one time because it's gonna find it right there. It's gonna come back true, yes, it's there. And it's gonna, it, the proofs is gonna start with the first two and go, 
Is it B, A, no? Okay, then is it A, B, yes? It would have two proofs. It would check twice and it would come back true because the list is found. Here it's gonna come back one time because the list is found right in the beginning uh, because the list now is BA. And then uh, here we have a parameter X and Y. So it's gonna to have to check for one, two, it's gonna to have to check for twice for the combination. So I don't wanna give you all the answers here. I'll let you play with this one here too. This is an S is also a parameter. So explain why uh, there are that many. Well, I just explained it to you. <laughs> so anyway, I want to give you the entire assignment. So uh, I'll let you explore that one a little bit more. But that's what the question's actually asking. I gave you that information because it's kind of difficult remotely to answer that question on your own. Um, so in number four, you're going to write a prolog relation that returns a list containing the union of elements of two given lists. So you're going to write kind of like a scheme function. Uh, Prolog was actually made from Lisp, which is uh, very similar to how scheme works. And so you can write functions in there too. Um, they're really just called relations. And so this one's going to take and combine two lists together. And then you're going to write another relation, anything you want that does something not performed above and explain uh, what the relation does. And then you're going to email it to me just like usual. Um, so. I lied. I thought there were five questions. Oh, there are five questions. Okay, I didn't lie. Um, there are five questions. They're worth one point each. Um, so have fun with this assignment, though. It um, should be fairly easy. And so what you're going to do then is uh, complete the assignment. And in order to complete the assignment, you're going to need to learn a little bit about Prolog. And we're going to go over right now the Prolog.ppt lecture that is in the lectures folder lecture notes, prolog.ppt. I have, I thought I downloaded it. I did, it's right here, prolog.ppt. And I'm gonna load it up and I'm gonna spend the rest of this particular lecture going over prolog. <clears throat> and then we'll start on a new topic for the next lecture. All right, so prolog, tell me about prolog. Look, prolog stands for programming logic. So P-R-O is programming, logic is L-O-G, prolog, that's where the name comes from. It was a widely used programming language, still widely used today. It's uh, widely used on the internet as well. It was developed in the 1970s. What is it good for? AI, artificial intelligence. It's used a lot in AI for expert systems. Well, what's an expert system? An expert system is a database that you can ask questions of. And remember that the magic eight ball you, uh, that is a kid's toy. You shake it around and you ask it a question and it comes back with one of these, you know, weird answers like, you know, shake the ball. Am I going to catch the coronavirus? And it would come up and it would show, it would tell you, oh, probably not. Or ask again later. Or yes or no. It would come up with an answer for you. That's Prolog. Prolog is the magic eight ball. And so to make it intelligent, we load it up with information. So we build it with a bunch of facts, like just because you live in Santa Clara County, you're not gonna catch the coronavirus. And so it would use that as logic. So it would have to ask, am I gonna catch the coronavirus? And it looked for the fact and it found, oh, just because you live in, it doesn't mean you're gonna catch it. All right, cool. And so then it would use that piece of logic or it would use another piece of logic that you'd put in there that would say something like, but there's been 40%, 4,000 cases or something. I don't know how many cases there are, but there's been X number of cases. And when X number of cases gets to a certain level and the cases get beyond 1,000, then the likelihood of you catching it goes up or something. You know, I don't want to scare anybody here. Uh, that's not really true. Uh, so you get the idea, I hope. Um, it's used for knowledge representation natural language processing, space state, to ser spa state space searching like the Rubik's Cube, expert systems and deductive databases or intelligent agents. Take an AI class and you'll see Prolog used a lot for those particular areas. This is not an AI class, this is a programming language concept, so I'm not really gonna go through all of the AI stuff, but that's a fun class you might wanna take in the future. So the overview, you ask the computer a question and it solves it using principles of logic. So the program states the known facts. Uh, you ask it a question, you make a statement and ask the computer to search for a proof of the statement to see if it's true. 
and then we have different search strategies that are used. Okay, so this is what's called a declarative programming language. You guys all remember from the midterm we had imperative programming languages and I asked you what some features of imperative programming languages and the flow of control is programmed by the programmer. Like the programmer figures out how the program is going to run from start to end and that program always runs the same way every time you start it. We have variables in there, we have iteration, we have recursion, flow control, we have all that stuff in there. Now declarative languages, that's, that's prologue. Prologue is a declarative language. We make declarations. We don't have variables. We don't tell prologue how to work. Prologue knows how to work itself. Prologue knows how to run its own programs. We just use the mechanisms that are given to us and we supply it with facts and rules and we let prologue run the way it knows how to run. So we're not program that, programming that stuff like we would in an imperative language. So we have propositions and symbolic logic that is used to create programs in Prolog. So that's what it means by being a declarative versus an imperative language. Now logic programming is not procedural. We don't tell it how to proceed. The programs don't state how the results are going to be computed. Instead, we use the built-in mechanism. So we, it's supplied for us. We give it relative facts and rules. And then we have a method for inference uh, that is done for us by default by the program. And that's what Prolog is actually doing for us. So it's based on predicate calculus and as, a, as a, another way of describing it. So here's kind of, a, here's kind of a, an example. This is not prolog syntax. I'm going to show you prolog syntax momentarily. This is the theory behind the, the logic background. So and if you just look at the bottom bullet point where you say, you know, if x is positive and y is negative, then y is less than x. Well, that makes pretty much good sense, um, which is how we're going to put facts and rules together um, to create statements uh, or horn clauses uh, and that will tell us information that is true or information that is false. So the predicate calculus, the proposition itself um, is made up of the objects and the relationships to each other. For example, these are called functors. Um, you might, they kind of look like functions, but they're not functions, they're functors. They uh, have a name, the name is in red, and they have parameters, the parameters are in blue. For example, Man John likes uh, pizza and baseball. So the first thing most students look at this and go, man, like I know what a man is and I know what likes, I know what likes means. And you have this English kind of definition for these particular words and there's some symbolic meaning to you when you say likes. Oh, likes, pizza, baseball, you know, hates, uh, coronavirus. Um, so that syntactic kind of meaning that come, comes along with it is part of the English language or part of the understanding. Okay, Prolog doesn't actually use that. Um, Prolog doesn't know what likes means or what man means. Prolog only knows that these are, are constant words or expressions that are used with absolutely no meaning associated with them. So keep that in mind as we go through some of the examples and you'll sort of get why there's no meaning. There's no hidden meaning behind any of the words. There's no sim symbolism with any of the, of the English definitions of these words. You can use any, you can use like A, B, C if you wanted to. So then we put things together. So a compound proposition consists of two or more propositions connected by these logical operators. All right, go back to discrete math and uh, <clears throat> review kind of what's going on there. The negative, the not, the conjunction, A and B, A or B, A is equivalent to B, A implies B, B implies A. Um, it's, a it's the same thing you learned in discrete math. Um, well, hopefully you learned it in discrete math. And then also the qualifiers. So the universal qualifier, the existential qualifier, there exists or there does not exist. Or for all, you know, for all women are human. I would hope so. Um, there is some sport that Bill likes. We don't know which one it is, but there one, there is a sport that Bill likes. Um, so you could put together using these qual uh, quantifiers, as they are called, um, to make more elaborate expressions. And I have the concept of resolution and unification. To resolve something, 
is how do we logically deduce from multiple horn clauses? So we start at the beginning and we go through the problem to re resolve it. And to unification is we determine when the hypotheses are satisfied. You can sort of see, think of it like sort of like backward and forward chaining, which is actually coming up, I believe. Uh, in one of these slides coming up here, we're gonna have this concept and maybe I'll just do it now so I don't have to do it later. Backward and forward chaining. If I went forward to solve a problem to resolve it, I would ask the question, and actually I'm looking out my window right now, um, and I'm looking at these clouds, and the question I'm gonna ask is, is it gonna rain? Yeah, I'm just gonna say, is it gonna rain? I'm gonna ask Prologue this question, and I'm gonna have Prologue answer this question for me doing a resolution process. To resolve the question and answer it for me with a yes or no, is it going to rain? Prologue is gonna go through the database and say, well, are there a lot of clouds? Yeah. Did it rain yesterday? Yeah. Um, is it on the forecast for today that it's going to rain? Yeah. Um, hmm. Do we have some darkness going on right now? Yeah. Then Prolog is going to come back after looking at all these things and it's going to conclude with, yes, it's going to rain. I guarantee it by the time I end finish this recording of this video, I'm going to see raindrops coming down. It's just a matter of time. Um, so Prolog would probably come back if, if Prolog had all that information stored inside of its database, it would come back and say, yes, it's going to rain. Okay. Unification kind of says, is the hypothesis true? The hypothesis. Uh, so I would say instead of asking Prolog, is it going to rain? I would say Prolog a definite statement. It's going to rain or Prolog. It's not going to rain. And Prolog would come back with false or true if, um, if I was correct or not correct. So instead, I just state the conclusion. And then I try to find out, Prolog tries to find out if the conclusion is true or false. So I, it's called backward chaining, where I go backward from a conclusion to see if it's true versus a forward chaining that says, here's my question. I don't know if it's true or false. You tell me if it's true or false which is a forward direction versus a backward direction. So in a backward direction, we're gonna say, you know, we don't know, it's gonna rain. Prologue, it's gonna rain. And it comes back and says, yes. Prologue, it's not gonna rain. And it could come back and say, no, it's gonna rain. Um, so depending upon what's gonna happen. So I don't know if it's gonna rain or not. Um, so if we go through these um, resolution process and we look at how these inferences actually going to be made and lucky for you you don't have to program these inferences they're done for you automatically and uh, Prolog uses a forward chaining by default um, you can change the resolution process but you don't actually have to you can leave it on default settings and Swishy doesn't actually allow you to change it it just uses both interchangeably depending upon how you've got it programmed so suppose you have two propositions that B implies A and you have that D implies C and that A is identical to D. Then you suppose you rename them A to D as T and then you can infer. So you can infer that C, you know, C implies um, T, therefore, well, T must imply C. Um, so you can infer that B implies C by substituting in. And so um, it's very similar to, you know, a mathematical calculation with substitution and you're substituting in one for another. So unification is the process of finding the values for the variables during the resolution so that the matching process can succeed. <clears throat> so we bring it together, we unify it, we bring it together. Um, and these work with the forward and the backward chaining as I just described. Um, so the instantiation is the temporary binding. So you're like, I thought you said we didn't have any variables. And eh, we don't. They don't call them variables. They call them instantiations. So we have X or we have S. We don't define them as variables, but we use them as instances or as temporary placeholders for data. We keep the data and then we use the data throughout the process. Um, so that um, you know we don't have to keep repeating it and getting the data, we have a placeholder for it. So we have this instantiation that happens to allow us to hold on to the data, to, to the current state. 
So with our terminology here, we have the logical and, we have the logical assertions that, are, that occur here in a, a structure. So what we're looking at here, this is the structure that you're going to be more familiar with, is the functor struct, structure. Excuse me, structure. See, even on video, I can't talk. Uh, so teachers, Barbara, class, which I'm trying to do, <laughs> we have a functor or a fact. I like to call them facts. Um, but they're really functors. This crap up here is just showing you how it works. It's just showing you how to put it together. Um, so we'll see some examples here and make a little bit more sense. And then we're going to have a question mark where we're going to actually run the program. So when you write a prologue program, you create a database. When you run it, you ask it questions, just like the Magic 8-Ball. How do you use the Magic 8-Ball? Well, you shake it up and then you ask it questions. You don't have to shake up prologue. Um, I, you probably could if you wanted to, but you don't have to shake pro prologue. You just you just load it up. You just start it, and then uh, you ask it questions. That's how you run it. So the variables start with uppercase letters, uh, remembering that. Constants are numbers that represent strings in lowercase. We'll see some examples, and I'll point this out in the examples. Uh, the variables always start with uppercase. The goal or the query is uh, has no left-hand side, so reigning... In Seattle, you'd write this at the prompt, the prompt being the little screen at the, in the shell. Tells Prolog to interpret to see if it can prove the clause. If you wrote this in and you actually had this fact, it would come back with yes. So all we have are facts, rules, and queries. So their collection of facts and rules is called the knowledge base. And Prolog uh, programs are called knowledge bases. And we use Prolog programs by posing queries. We run them. So we use them or we run the program by creating a query. So here's an example of the knowledge base where we have woman Janet and we have a woman Stacy and plays flute Stacy. And so we can ask Prolog uh, woman Stacy and Prolog comes back and says yes um, because it's in the database, it's in the knowledge. Plays flute Stacy, Prolog comes back and says yes. Plays flute Mary, Prolog comes back and says are you kidding me? No, it doesn't say that. It just says no. Um, you could program it to do that, but it's very difficult and it's not worth your time. Uh, but yeah. So it tries to put things together. In this particular case, these facts are statements, the propositions that are assumed to be true, such as female Janet, male Steve, brother Steve Janet, which is the brother Janet is the sister, and Steve is the brother. Remembering the propositions have no intrinsic semantics. They mean what the programmer intends for them to mean, not what they mean in English. So let me give you another more sophisticated example here um, to sort of um, tell you how things can be put together. So I can stay, say stuff like, all short people like pizza. Uh, which I think is probably true. Um, John is short. And then you're going to ask Prolog, does John like pizza? The prolog can come back and say yes, because John is short and all short people like pizza. Yeah, good. And then you could say, well, Larry is tall and all tall people like chocolate. Does Larry like pizza? Prolog is going to come back and say no. It's not going to come back and say, no, he doesn't like pizza. He likes chocolate. You'd actually have to ask it. Well, then Prolog, does Larry like chocolate? And then he's Prolog will come back and say, yes, because all tall people like chocolate and Larry is tall. Okay, very simple. Um, take that concept and complicate it a little bit more with more logic. And then you get into mimicking how humans actually think. If you think about it, how much different is that? from how humans think. Don't humans memorize a bunch of stuff like the earth is not round or the earth is round and if I walk to the edge of the earth I'm going to fall off so therefore I should not walk to the edge of the earth because the earth is flat and I'm going to fall off it's not round. Uh, okay that's kind of primitive thinking from the you know beginning of time but if you think about it you know, kind of people go, well, it's raining outside. If it's raining outside, it actually started raining. So you have this live update, weather, weather report, <clears throat> Prolog was correct. It's going to rain. 
So if it's raining outside, then I'm going to bring an umbrella. And if it's not raining, I'm not going to bring an umbrella outside. So if my I were a human and I was asking myself this question, I look outside and go, oh, it's raining. If I'm going to go outside, I'm probably going to grab that umbrella. Maybe. Who knows? Or throw on a jacket or something. It's the same kind of logic we use as humans, which gives it that AI component. So it's pretty much an AI thing. We have another element of prologue, and this is called the rule. And what you're looking at is a rule. The rule combines the facts to increase the knowledge base of the system. So we have a sun x, y. And then this is actually an arrow, believe it or not. If you imagine this being an arrow here, kind of like if you drew a line between this little dot up here and this little dot there, looks like an arrow, um, which, which, makes, which actually stands for implies. So X is the son of Y if X is male and X is the child of Y. So these are two facts that are separated by a comma that are put together that imply this. So the son X, Y, it leads to or infers that number one, that X is a male and number two, that X is a child of X, Y. Like, that way that you're a son if you're a male child. So read about that a little bit on the um, website and kind of dwell on that one for a bit and it'll start making sense to you. This is prologue syntax, by the way. There's a dot at the end of the sentence. This can and should be, I don't know, It's for illustrate purposes, it's on two lines, but you could put it on one line. <clears throat> the facts look like this. There's a dot at the end. So the dot says we're done. That's how you make a fact. That's how you make a rule. And that's all you do. That's the syntax of the language. So if you're going to make a function, well, the function looks like this. And there's stuff combined in the function to make it like concatenate two lists together. And I'll, I'll show you that momentarily. But, uh... So here's the elements of a prologue database. Okay, so remember that question number one, where you're going to define sibling and sister and brother. So uh, this is slide number 20, and it's pretty much the answer um, to the question. So here we have an example, and this is gonna show us the resolution process as well. So we have a parent of XY that is a mother of XY. We also have a parent of XY that has a uh, that's a father. So we have two parents. We have a mother parent and we have a father parent. And what I'm talking about are these two lines right here. And you're like, well, aren't we defining this twice? No, we're not. Um, so don't think about this semantically as a definition. This is not a variable. This is not a fact that this is, this is a fact. Well, actually this is a rule. These are facts. This is combined into a rule. And, um, there's no, there's no, nothing wrong with repeating it because a parent is a mother and a parent is a father. Um, you know, the traditional family has a mother and has a father. And then the grandparents, well, each one of the parents has a grandparent and there's two grandparents. Well, originally, if you're lucky if you have all of them alive still, uh, but the grandparents should have, uh, each one of your grandparents should have a mother and a father as well. Uh, which are grandparent mothers and fathers. So the goal of to the system is, is either going to be proved or disproved. And when the variables are included, the system identifies the instantiations and makes them true or false. So this X, Y are placeholders for people's names. Um, so you can create a database of your family and then you can ask, well, is Larry the brother of so-and-so or the son of so-and-so? You ask Prologue the virtual machine questions. Son Bob Harry, yes. King Bob of France, no. Um, so returns the, uh, the bounded variables with yes or no answers. Prolog only answers with yes or no, or true or false, depending upon the prolog system that you have installed. So you combine answers to questions to variables. Who is Bob the son of? X is equal to Harry. And then it comes back and says, you would say son Bob X, who is male, X is equal to Bob and Harry. Well, then male X 
is Bob the son of somebody? And then you have this little empty placeholder that means we don't know. Or there some, and then no variable in this particular case is given. We're just trying to figure out, is he the son of somebody? And then it will come back true or false. So backtracking, how are the questions resolved? Well, we start, we recall, we recall, well, recall the rule and then go to the fact. And then forward chaining, I've already talked about backward and forward chaining. But forward chaining starts with the rules and then it applies it to the facts to see if it works. So under forward chaining, Father Bob is matched against Father X to derive the new fact that man Bob is in the database and the new fact satisfies the goal, so it stops. You don't have to really worry about the forward versus the backward chaining. It's just explaining how the system actually resolves the data. So in the backward example, in this particular slide, you use the goal to work backwards to a fact. So in the backwards, you start with the conclusion, you say it's gonna rain, or man, you're given man Bob, and you're just gonna say, is man, is Bob a man? Uh, yes or no, match against the man X to create the new goal, father Bob, father Bob goal matches pre-existing fact, thus the query is satisfied, and yes, we can come back and say, yes, it is. So are you gonna, Solve by following the, the question forward to an answer, or are you going to start with a conclusion and go backwards? So I already actually kind of talked about this, so I'm going to pass through it again. The second part of the resolution process does what's called a depth-first or a breadth-first search. Go back to uh, data structures and algorithms and take a look at uh, the depth-first um, versus the, the breadth-first. These are just the resolution processes Prolog designers went with a top-down, which is backward chaining, debt-first resolution process. That little bullet point in red here is telling you what the default is. You're not stuck with that. You can actually change that, but I wouldn't do it for this assignment. If you get into Prolog for artificial intelligence in the future, you might consider changing around the resolution process depending upon how your application is designed. So debt-first starts first, finds a sequence, or a match of the first subset goal and then continues down the other sub goals until it finds it. Brett first processes all levels in parallel. It's like, are we gonna start at the top of the tree and we're gonna go through each level down to each level down to each level. That's the breadth first versus the depth first. Go down till we can't go anymore. We hit a leaf node and then we go back up and we try another branch. So that's the search process. So we have the uncle X Thomas with male X sibling X Y as parent Thomas Y. And if we were to use backward chaining here, we would find an X to make uncle X Thomas true. First find an X to make the male X true. Then find a Y to make the sibling true, the X Y sibling true. Then check to see if it has parent. If it is, then it's true. This is a recursive search until all the rules and facts are reached. Until the, till the facts are reached, I should say. Uh, so it's called backward chaining. So, all right. So here's an example that's going to help you with that first uh, with, with the uh, the assignment question number one. Consider the database. So now instead we're going to populate it. So we have mother Betty Janet, mother Betty Steve, mother Janet Adam and father Steve Dillon. Um, and then we have the rules. We have a parent, which is a mother and father. We have a grandparent that has a parent on both sides, mother and father. And the goal is grandparent X comma Adam. So is uh, the grandparent of X Adam? Hmm. So if we go through the resolution process and you can download this slide and go through it a little bit slower if you'd like. Um, we need you to proceed by attempting to match and so in this particular case, we're gonna start with, because the question in this particular case is grandparent X Adam. So we're gonna start with grandparent X Adam here. To prove this goal, we must satisfy the sub goals. And the two sub goals are parent XY and parent YZ. And so we're gonna put the Adam in for Z. Um, and so we have parent Y, Z, y Adam. So we're gonna use a depth first search in this particular example and attempt to satisfy the first goal. So we're looking for parent X, Y here. And then to satisfy it, well, we're gonna find it up here. We have mother, Betty, Janet. 
And so the fact matches a sub goal with the instantiation of X equal to Betty and Y is equal to Janet. And then we're going to instantiate it. So X is now Betty and Y is now Janet. We're going to substitute those guys in to the grandparent and see if it's true. And so the Z is Adam and we're trying to find, we have a, the Y is Janet and X is Betty. And so next prolog must solve the sub goal parent Janet Adam. Can it do that? Once again, program uses the first matching rule it from, comes into, instantiates the X with Janet and the Y with Adam to see if that's true. Substituting those values in, it results with parent Janet Adam, mother Janet Adam. So the, the three facts in the database are applied. And now we have to satisfy the original goal. Can we satisfy the original goal that grandparent X was Adam? So it's now proven with the instantiation of Betty because it found a combination with Betty. So Prolog returns with success. It will say yes, because X is equal to Betty. So the answer is yes, proven that Janet comma Adam is true. Um, so we found the, the match essentially. You don't have to do any of this. You don't have to program any of this. This is done for you. This is an example of how Prolog works. Prolog is doing this for you. So if we solve this graphically, and I'm just going to kind of step through this here. It's the same problem we just looked at a few minutes ago. And I'm stepping through it so you can sort of see how the resolution process works. This is demonstrating the depth first approach. Knowing that it went down this side of the tree first. Now it's going down this side of the tree all the way to the end until it resolves it. And so we have the resolution process demonstrated with a depth, um, depth first approach, which is the default used in Prolog. All right, believe it or not, that's everything you need to know about facts and rules in Prolog. You're gonna need to probably study this a little bit more before you do the assignment, or maybe you can just jump into the assignment. Take a look at some of the examples and lots of the stuff will start making more sense to you. So now let's talk about the prologue list. You're going to have a couple of questions in the assignment that's going to have you work with a list. So it consists of zero or more elements separated by commas enclosed in square brackets. So knowing that the syntax over here had rounded uh, parentheses, prologue lists have brackets. The notation is using brackets. So if we're using brackets, we know we're looking at a list. And the prolog lists are linked lists. So you don't have to invent the linked list concept. It's already given to you, not like C++. Um, it's given to you already. The empty list is just an empty list here. This is what the empty list looks like. Here's a list that's populated that's not empty and it contains numbers and characters. You can put words in there. You can put a list in there. You can put anything you want in there. So you can mix and match the data types because there's no such thing as data types in this language. Um, instead, there's just elements. All the elements are treated equally. There, you can also put placeholders in there. You can put facts in there. You can put anything you want in there. The prolog list notation has a head and a tail. So this is where the head and this is where the tail comes into place. For example, the head might be one, the tail might be two, three, A and B. Here, this is the head, this is the tail. So the head is the first element. Go back to your concepts of linked lists, and this will make a lot of sense, hopefully. To further illustrate here, we have the list notation considering the following goals with the head tails equal to one, two, three, four. Head is one, tail is two, three, four. And Prolog will come back and say, yep, that's what we got here. Or we could have head one, head two, and the tail. Well, then that would be head one would be one, two, and then the, the tail. So we can have as many heads as we want. Uh, we only have one tail, but we can have as many heads or any as many components as we want in the list. Okay, remember you're gonna write a list that takes two lists and puts them together. Well, not to totally give it away, but all the answers to the homework assignment are in this lecture. Um, yeah, I guess I totally, um, spoiler alert, I have given you, well, too much information because this lecture is gonna cover everything. But the idea is I want you to take a look at the lecture and I wanna take you a look at the assignment, see if you can put the pieces together yourself to see if you can figure out how to do this. Um, but it's all here, you know, there's nothing else you have to read. Um, so here's append. What does append do? Append is a built-in function. Append, 
And so we have this function here, functor, with the rounded um, brackets. And inside we have two lists. We have the square brackets, say one, two, three, and then we have AB. And if we append this together, we have one, two, three, AB. X is what we're going to append it to. So this is not, okay, so don't think of these as parameters to a function. This is not a function call. This is a functor or a fact that says a list x is one, two, three, and a, b put together. And so if we actually asked what x was, we would say, well, then it's one, two, three, and a, b. So here's two items that are put together for x. And then we have this guy going on here where it says append <coughs> one, two, three, and x. Well, x is one, two, three, a, b from, from here. And then we get one, two, three, AB. So then X is really AB because it's the difference between one, two, three, and one, two, three, AB. Yeah, stare at that one for a while. And then stare at this next one here where we have X. These are just different combinations of the append. X, which is uh, the one, two, three, AB. And then AB, now X is one, two, three, which is the difference. So we took out the AB. Here we uh, combine the AB together. So this is the difference. So these are different combinations. Go online, take a look at the append and see how the append works. There's a really good documentation on the SWI uh, prologue site as well as on Swish the prologue site. So remember before I said you could find multiple um, proofs a proof is to ask Prolog a question and have it come back and give you an answer. So here's a, an example of how the proof works. You put in a semicolon. If you put in a semicolon, here's the semicolon, instructs Prolog to find another solution. Go ahead and just find another solution. So if Prolog was trying to find um, x, y with 1, 2, 3, the list 1, 2, 3, and if it came back and said, well, X is empty, Y, let's say make that one, put a semicolon in there. Then it continues. X is one, Y is two, three, X is one, two, Y is three, X is one, two, three. It just continues to resolve it by substituting in character by character or, or list item by list item. And so the semicolon at the end of the line says continue. Continue the resolution process to find the associated fact that matches it and see if we can resolve this. And so then we can figure out and say, yes, X is one, two, three, Y is empty. So here is another uh, defining a function. This is called my append. My append takes an empty list and adds two lists together. So, you know, just in case I haven't given you enough of the answers already, here's how you would write a function. So this is how you would write a function or a functor um, to define how to combine two lists together. My append takes one list and appends another list to it. And so my append has a head and a tail. The head is the list, the tail is the other list. And so my append takes an takes the tail and has it equal to the list plus the second list, the first list and the second list. I guess we could have called it list one and list two, but it's just list and list two. So that actually is how you would append two lists together, uh, one to the other. And so if you wrote this, this, this rule, and it really is a rule with a fact, there's a fact, there's a fact, and then there's a rule in here. So there's the fact, there's the rule. And if you put it in a file, you can put it in a file and call it myappend.pl. All prolog files um, have pl for pro prolog as the file extension. And then you could just run the prolog file uh, or import it into the prolog session, <clears throat> load it up, and then you could run it. So how would you load it up? You'd use the word consult, consult this. When you consulted this, it's kind of like an import or include. Consult brings the file in, so now we can run the function. And then we just run the function. And guess what, here's the function, and this is how the function works. So I'm gonna let you dwell on that, because I've already given too much of the assignment away, and I want there to be some element of learning going on with this.
Um, so study this a little bit and you'll see how the process resolves. Here's my reverse. <clears throat> you might imagine it reversalis, takes and puts it in the opposite order. And so you can consult it and then take a, a list, one, two, three, and then <clears throat> return it as X. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we're going to have X is equal to three, two, one. So here's prologue um, solving the, the eights puzzle. And uh, so the eights puzzle is, is a game. Um, these are like little squares that you'd move around. And uh, this happens to have the blanks, and there's one blank square because you need space in order to move the squares around. So you have a three by three grid with eight tiles, numbered one through eight, and an empty slot in the middle. And this is a possible configuration uh, or a solution to the, to the eights puzzle. And so you can have a start, let's say maybe this was the start and the goal is to put it into this format, although you probably would want to do the goal is this and start with this and the goal with that. But in any way, you can do it any way you want. And so you can have a possible start and a goal configuration as shown here. And then you can come up with a solution to it by moving things around. And if you watch the flow of this, you'll see how you could move the spaces into the empty to move everything around until you've reached the goal state. And so you have a partial depth first search tree. This is what the search tree would look like um, to get from the start state to the goal state, moving the pieces around. And you can put this in a prologue program and have prologue solve it for you. And so this is how you would solve it. You would enter in as a list the three by three grid. So you'd have three lists of three items each. You'd have put in the start state, you'd put in the goal states. And then prologue would have um, the information given to it. So you'd represent the, the puzzle using a list of nine numbers with zero representing the empty space. So you can sort of see how these nine numbers would, would show, the grid would show in a, in a list of nine numbers. And then you'd have a move function that would move. So you'd make uh, moves using the rule in the form of move from puzzle one to puzzle two. And there's 24 of these in all. And so the two rules describe all of the, all of the moves that can be made with the empty upper left-hand corner. So upper left corner. So move and then the Bs, the, the ones in bold are showing you what pieces are actually being moved. And you could go through the entire series of 24. So the workhorse of the program is to solve the rule with solve with the start, the goal, state one, state two, depth and bound, where you've got the, the list of the input, list of the output, the depth of the current search tree, and the bound of the, it's the length of the tree, the depth of the bound. And so you'd solve it by going through each one of the states until you reached it from the start state to the goal state. So that's an example of how you would be able to use Prolog to solve a Rubik's Cube um, question. Um, Prolog does math. This is absolutely not a math language, and I don't recommend doing math with this language, but there's arithmetic expressions that can also be evaluated. There's a predicate is, which is used as an infix operator. So the variable is expression. So x is, in this particular case, 3 times 4. And then as you might imagine, the arithmetic operators that you're familiar with are used as well. It also supports relational operators, the less than or equals to, the greater than. So you just go three times four. And yes, Prolog can do math and arithmetic expressions. Um, and people do use it for this, but I don't know if I'd recommend it. Um, just go back to the midterm and think about the order of um, operator precedence and how many levels of operator precedence are really defined? Nothing, just one level. And uh, associativity rules, eh, it's just one. So it's, it's this just one associativity with that. So it is kind of limited. Other applications for pro Prolog would be intelligent systems, complicated knowledge bases, natural language processing, logic and data analysis. Um, these are some areas where if you go on to take an artificial intelligence course, you might get exposed to Prolog again. Um, Prolog um, does a lot of um, language processing. Um, does a lot of problem solving where you have lists of data 
and you're trying to find correlations between the data or you're trying to answer questions on it. So in conclusion, we have some strengths. Uh, we have a strong tie to formal logic, many algorithms that become very simple if implemented, and Prolog does all of this for you. You just give it the pieces, give it the facts, give it the rules. It already knows how to make decisions. Weakness? Uh, well, it's kind of complicated syntax. It's kind of limited. All you need to do is write facts and rules and, or create a list and have the list processed through a functor. Um, and it is, um, you know, kind of complicated looking for a programmer. Now, if you're not a programmer, you'd probably think this was easiest programming on earth. And you go, oh, I want to be a programmer because this is really simple. There's not very much to write. Um, but unfortunately, when you look at it, it's difficult to understand the program. What is the program doing? I have no idea. Um, in fact, just go on to the Swishy website and you'll look at some of the sample programs that are out there. And the first thing you're going to say is, how do I run this? How do I make this work? And if you really want to get familiar with Prolog, go out there and play around with some of those sample databases um, or knowledge bases, as they're, they're supposed to be called, and uh, see if you can ask it questions and see if you can use it and follow through the documentation and uh, it will, uh, you'll definitely be able to hopefully pick up to see, you, know, you guys are computer science students, you should be able to figure out how to run a Prolog program. Um, and it's pretty simple actually. But you know, it's difficult to understand the program at first sight. Issues are what applications can Prolog excel at, knowledge bases. It's pretty limited. I couldn't write, can't really even write hello world with it really. I guess you could write hello world. Just make a fact that the world says hello world and you just say well, hello world and it comes back and says yes. Is Prolog suited for large applications? Probably not. How about binding Prolog with the, another language? Is that a good idea? Yes, but it's not been done yet. Um, it hasn't really been done yet. So I'd say uh, uh, maybe it is a good idea, but we haven't seen it yet. So Okay, so that's pretty much all I could give you on the Prolog language. Um, it's very, uh, very straightforward. Um, your next step, what I would try to do, is uh, go to the Swish website. Here it is up here. You can pause the video and go to this website up here. You can download, you can cut and paste from the window and save your code. Uh, you can download it, um, uh, save it. When you submit it to me, you can actually just open up the Microsoft Word file and paste in the answers to the questions and the, 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 uh, the functions that you're writing. Uh, these are examples. Um, what do I have open? I have the movie one open. Um, there's a prologue tutorial you can run through, um, learn about how to write prologue programs. The tutorials are pretty cool using Swishy version seven. It shows you, um, how to, how to use it. So play around with this website, play around with the tutorials, play around with the examples and see if you can answer the questions that are in the assignment. And when you're satisfied with it, turn the assignment in and uh, we'll move on uh, to the next one. So Prolog is the, so there's pretty much all I can say about Prolog. I can't really say very much more about it. So anyway, so I hope you've enjoyed the lecture and uh, stay tuned for another lecture. I will be updating you by email, letting you know when the lectures are available and uh, what you should be doing in the class um, while we're in this online modality. Um, so continue working on the assignments, uh, continue turning them in, and I will see you for another lecture very soon. Okay, so be safe and be well, and I will talk to you later. Thanks for watching.